This is one you've brought to the table, Ray, which is uh, Replit, I believe. Maybe set the story up. Tell us uh, about the company and what they've done more recently and what this means for founders. Yeah, so so Replit is uh, um, you know one of the hot companies in Silicon Valley to keep an eye on. They are they are a YC company. They're already you know a unicorn. Paul Graham has spoken about it a lot as well. I I know the uh, Amjad, the founder, who's he's spoken at one of our conferences. But really, what what Replit set out to do is to build a platform to enable something like a billion people around the world to be able to to build software uh, without code. They recently launched something called Replit Agent, which is an insane product by itself. I was able to build a product and ship it for the first time ever in my life. You know, I never was never a coder. I've looked at some stuff here and there, but I was able to not just build a, a, a tool, but to also publish it and host it online. So just like you use ChatGPT, you can tell it, I want to build an app that does one, two, three. And it will build it for you. It's interactive in a way that it's showing you what, what it's building. It's asking you to check things, you know, the agent asking you to check things, if they work, if they don't work. It's almost like having your own development team that's doing stuff for you for a fraction of the cost and for limitless iterations. Now, the, I used it when they first released the, the Replit agent um, a couple of weeks ago. It was good, uh, but it had some, you know, there were some issues here and there. Uh, it almost felt like you have a almost incompetent dev team that's, <laughs> that's doing the, you know, the work for you. So, you know, you can ask them to work limitless hours, but it felt that it got stuck at some points. And every time you ask it to build something new, it would break something else. I've heard recently that it's really improved uh, tremendously. They recently, in like last week, hosted a, a hackathon with X AI, and a lot of people were talking about how much the product has improved. So I'm 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 excited to to like try it again and see really the level of improvement. But I suggest you give it a try. It's it's really really cool how you can even build a GPT wrapper, you know, app in a matter of one hour, maybe like host it put it on a website, create a login, sign up process for it, publish it, and make it available for the public. It's pretty incredible. Just, just to be very clear, we've seen examples of ChatGPT and others write some code, like little snippets of code. We've seen other companies build tools that will kind of generate large quantities of code and put it into the right files and libraries and things. These guys seem to be taking it one step further and they're automatically loading in dependencies, setting up environments and publishing it into production. Exactly. And so they're just, they're taking it just that, that next and final step. That is, you know, a pretty, pretty big breakthrough. So the first thing I built, actually, though, the one that I built was a, was kind of like a trading options trading tool, because to get access to that data, you need to have like a Bloomberg terminal or whatever, which is super expensive. So I built some sort of like an options analytics tool for Tesla, specifically Tesla stock. And it worked really well. Uh, and I was able to build it and publish it within like a very short period of time. And that was the first time I built and shipped like a product myself. But it's just insane, like thinking where this technology could be in a few years from now, democratizing software uh, engineering to anyone. Essentially, anyone can go on and build the, an idea they, they've had or, or something they've dreamt about. What are the key takeaways here for founders listening? You know, the first is there's really zero excuse now for you to build your MVP. You know, uh, you, you meet all these founders who are like, oh, I'm just looking for a technical co-founder. It's just like, you don't need a technical co-founder to go build your MVP anymore. So get out of bed, get off the couch, stop listening to this podcast. No, no, wait finish listening to this podcast, <laughs> then go and uh, start building your MVP as quickly as you can. Uh, I think for engineers listening, there's really no excuse for you to not to be a 10 or 100x more productive engineer today than you were yesterday. And then you will the say before that, you know, at the, at the low end, I think this puts a number of engineering jobs at risk. But really in the sen mid to senior level, this is an, an incredible way to just bootstrap prototypes and help you do way, way more and uh, way more quickly. I think if you're thinking about startup ideas and business models, I think this affects, you know, I've said this a number of times on the show. I think this changes the nature of vertical SaaS and the business models around a lot of uh, kind of bespoke application development, or rather the business models around generalized application development. So I think unless you are building a multiplayer experience, a massive multiplayer experience, like a social network or a game, 
where the rules have to be common amongst all users, or you're building something that manipulates the real world, like an Airbnb or an Uber. It's hard to imagine why somebody wouldn't just generate their vertical SaaS software for themselves and for their immediate small community. So what I mean by that is, let's say, let's say you're a dentist and you need a CRM for your patients. It's hard to imagine why somebody couldn't just say to their agent, to their personal AI assistant, you know what, generate me a basic CRM to manage my patients. And it should have this screen for my secretary, my assistant, and this should have this screen for me when I go home. And just generates it on the fly. Or for you to, you know, it is, is a, as a manager in a business to say, I want a HR tool that allows me to grade my employees on these five axes. And I want to be able to send the, pro, you know, the process to the frontline managers. And then I want to send it to the employees. And then I want to send it to their colleagues that they work with the most during the day. And it just generates a HR, you know, performance review software or generates a dentist CRM software uh, kind of on the fly, completely bespoke for you. And so, you know, I'm sure there are plenty of reasons why some people, some dentists, some managers will lack the creativity to build a really great version of these. But it strikes me that a lot of people will be generating a lot of software at runtime, on demand, completely bespoke for their use case, their business, their geography, their market, their what have you. And that, that changes the, the economics and changes the, the, the ecosystem for software development, like dramatically, completely, completely is, is earth shattering to, to the way that we think about software today. Yeah, there's going to be, I think, an insane uh, exponential growth and in, in, in new just apps and products and websites and tools. And like you said, I think you made a very good point about personalization and customization for specific needs. And I think there's going to be also a big effect on, on enterprises as well. So now mm -hmm. enterprises can really build their own tools in-house. You could hire one or two people within, within your large corporation and then focuses on just building personalized, customized tools for your organization instead of money on software. I think an interesting analog here is if you imagine how hard it was to produce a book until the printing press. To produce a book was extremely labor intensive and costly and only the most important things were ever produced into books or into even flyers and pamphlets. And the printing press massively reduced the cost of that and therefore massively increased the production of the written word and the distribution of the written word. If you think of how hard it was to produce video, you know, it took video production teams, high-end cameras, right? Editing suites, broadcast licenses, and so on. And now everyone everywhere is producing video all the time, right? And the, the minutes of high quality video produced is probably an exponential curve. And I think you can look at software the same way, right? Look at how much software was produced in the early days of computing and how that has slowly but surely increased and probably increased across an exponential. And now everyone everywhere can be producing software, lines of code and running it in production for themselves, for their families, for their small businesses and for their enterprises. And so this is literally the democratization of software development, the same way it was the democratization of video production, the same way as the democratization of writing and publishing. And holy shit, <laughs> we just, I just think we can't predict. We just can't predict what this looks like. And the impact it would have as well on, on, you know, Amjad talks about, he gives, gives some examples of actual examples that already happened before even they introduced rapid agent of people in other countries, like in Africa or in, in Asia, it's changed their life completely because they are able to mm -hmm. make a lot of money off rapid building things to a point where it's changed their life completely. So I think there's a lot of people around the world that will get impacted. There's a lot of smart people that are in other countries that don't have the access, but now with this, they, they'll be able to do a lot more. This is almost the definition of democratization, right? It's about, democratization is about spreading the even distribution of power, of literacy, of opportunity, right? That's what it means. And so if you imagine the impacts on society when reading and writing became democratized, all sorts of smart people who are in the mud and the squalor could suddenly read the Bible for themselves or read and write documents for themselves and transfer knowledge between their family members for themselves. Same with video. People can now tell their own stories, forgotten stories or narratives that the, the mainstream doesn't want you to know. Also conspiracy theories and bullshit, right? And so, yes, this will, in theory, distribute economic power 
and intellectual power and opportunity globally. And sometimes that means that the people who had the power, the exclusive access to the power, lose power, right? So when you rebalance power, it often looks like an attack on those who had it. There's a lot of criticism to be leveled at what an Elon would call a woke mind virus, right? Extreme left wokeism. And I think there is legitimate criticism of that. But there is also some truth and necessity to it, which is the rebalancing of power between certain groups to other groups. And, and certain disadvantaged groups are now getting more advantage or more equal access to things. But there's also this a little bit of pretending going on of like, well, it shouldn't worry you guys who are in power. It's all good. It's just spreading the love. But no, they are concerned about something real, which is that they are, by definition, losing an advantage, right? And people, I think it doesn't serve anyone to pretend that's not the case. Because when a certain group that was used to being powerful and advantaged is losing that advantage, you're going to see backlashes. You're going to see potentially violence. You're going to see all sorts of stuff. And so this is, I'm just broadening this out, right? There's, there is a lot of examples of rebalancing of power of access and so it's, on. It's, yeah, it's partly rebalancing or even transfer of, of that power. Part of it is democratic. Well, rebalancing yeah. requires transfer, right? Rebalancing requires transfer. It's, and so my point is only that we should not be pretending everyone's going to be fine. No, people who are used to having an advantage are going to lose some of that advantage. Of course, yeah. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying we shouldn't pretend it's not happening because it means we're not engaging with the truth of it. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, the analogy you used, I think, is you know frames it in a, in the right way. What happened to written media or the press, and then what happened to video and all of that? You know, there's been a big shift from where it used to be, and people who controlled it back in the day to those who control it now, or maybe control it to a less lower extent. But I think it's just, yeah, it's it's a good way to to frame it, and that's what's happening with software. I mean, I, I must admit, actually, now that I'm t talking about it. You know, you and I and others who've been on this show, we're insiders, right? We've had access to money, to engineers, to product management, to design, to the insights and the skills required to build this software. And we've benefited from the value creation and the monetization of that. And if I'm, af if I'm being completely blunt, this is scary to me, right? This is the democratization of my skills, right? And, and all of our skills probably listening to this show. And so we need to be thinking about what does this mean for the disruption of our industry, of our, of our earning potential, of our kind of this scarce skill set that we've had, and how do we ride the wave versus get demolished by the wave? And maybe the answer is there isn't, there isn't a way to ride the wave, except for building one of these first, these, these few companies that are going to be the, the sources of the disruption. So evolving, I think we have to evolve. Get in or get squashed. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Those are our thoughts about Replit and the democratization of power and how Software is going to become just like writing, just like reading, just like video production. It's going to be everywhere. Do you guys believe it? How does it change software? If you're an engineer, how are you thinking about this for your job? If you're a founder, how is it going to change your business model and your plans? Jump in the comments, let us know what you're thinking, and we'll join you down there.